I agree with that prayer. And all of us do. That's why we say amen. Amen truly uh, means we agree that the Lord will apply his word. This morning, we're going to look at the amazing Hannah biography and Eli the failure biography. And, and remember, the book of First and the book of Second Samuel has constant contrasts between an example that God elevates of, of what we should all want to be like, a positive example, and a negative one to make it really clear. And that's what we see here. And so that's the second lesson as we walk through the books of 1st, 2nd Samuel. We looked at the Christology, Christos, Christ study, how he's the theme of the whole Bible. Remember, creator, redeemer, and judge. But now we're gonna look at these, what I call sacred biographies. God writing biographies. I mean, a lot of people write biographies, but when God writes it, it's amazing. And then we're gonna go through uh, other lessons. But Hannah, the amazing woman. And, and let's just start right out in verse six. So let's turn to 1 Samuel in your Bibles. Uh, and we're gonna spend an awful lot of time reading the Bible and studying it. But let's go to 1 Samuel chapter one and verse six. And who did I leave off on? Joella, I think. Did you read? You read. Did you? You read. So, oh, wait a minute. Haven't learned all of your names yet. Jamaica, you get uh, 1 Samuel 1, 6. And uh, then uh, Jess Lee. How do you say that? Jess Lee. And like Jess Sill is who's filming back there. So it's like Jess Lee is like Jess Hill. I mean, that's great. Okay, let's look as, as Jamaica reads, follow along in your Bible and look at how hard it was for Hannah in her home situation. Now remember, this is a sacred biography. And what makes that unique is that God is looking at things we wouldn't see. He tells us what people are thinking. He tells us what people are feeling. He tells us what they say when no one else hears them. You understand, that's what's really neat about the Bible. When God writes a biography, it's like he is giving us all the information we need. And the, the beginning of it, Jamaica's gonna read verse six for us, please. Whoa, there's a lot of truths in that verse. The first thing that, that Jamaica read is her rival, her rival, guess what? You talk about a sad marriage. Uh, this woman, Hannah, was not the only wife of her husband. He had two wives. Now how would you like someone to say, I love you so much I wanna marry you, but I love someone else so much I wanna marry them? Immediately, what does it feel like? Rival, rival. That means that they were both, they were both trying to get their husband's love and attention and admiration and appreciation. Can you imagine cooking the meal? You know, if it was your turn to cook and, and as a wife, you wanted the husband to think the meal was the best meal in the world. But then when the other wife cooked the meal, can you imagine what it would be like? Constant rivalry. The second thing, look what it says in verse six that Jamaica read. Her revival provoked her severely to make her miserable. Her rival was an adversary. Now, um, you know, rivalry is okay when it's like my soccer team and your soccer team, you know, we're both playing soccer and you know, we want our team to win. That's kind of fun. This is not fun. This rivalry made the life of Hannah miserable. Now there's one more thing. What's the last thing Jamaica read? What does it say at the end? She wasn't able to have children. Why? What does the Bible say? Yeah. Now here's a lesson from the Bible. God grants conception. That means there are no accidental children. When I went to school, I went to school with a boy, and when I met him, we both were football players, 
And uh, it's hard to believe I ever played football. I don't look like a football player, but I was on the team, okay? And he was the star of the team. He was, he was a football player. And I got to know him, and he was a Christian. And I said, tell me more about you. And you know what he told me? This is his personal assessment of his life. He said, I was an accident after a football game. My father was a football player. One of the cheerleaders was his girlfriend. After the football game, they went alone to his house and they were together sexually and conceived a child and that was that boy that was my friend. His father in high school with a cheerleader in high school conceived a child out of marriage, out of wedlock, illegitimately, and that's where this kid came from. So do you know what he thought of himself? I'm an accident after a football game. That's what he thought of himself, that he was an accident. Nobody wanted him, he wasn't planned. And I said to him, you don't really believe that, do you? I said, God grants conception. No child is born that God does not allow to be born, and no child is born that God didn't design them. Who their parents are, how they got here. You say, how do you know that? Well, it says it in Psalm 139. Psalm 139 says, that God designs us right down to our DNA double helix. Everything about us, the unchangeable features of your life, whether you're a man or a woman, what, what capacity you have athletically, academically, and anything, every part of our life God designed. But God put Hannah uh, into a situation where she wasn't the only wife, where the other wife hated her, and where God did not allow her to have children. Now, nowadays, that would be considered a blessing. Did you know most people don't want children nowadays? In the Western world, the, the advanced world, the world of wealth in Europe, in the Orient, in, in I mean the Orient, in, the, in Asia, and in North America and South America, children are considered expensive and a, and kind of a distraction. People don't want children. In fact, most children in America, uh, more than half of them are aborted. You know that, aborted. They don't want them, they, they murder them in America. You probably don't have abortion yet, do you, in the Philippines, do they? It, it'll come sooner or later, even though you know all the Catholic influence here, but it will come because the world doesn't want children. They're in the way, they're expensive, there's too many people on the earth, that's the way people think. Well, God grants conception and would not allow Hannah to have children. Now this was very hard for Hannah. And God did not call her on the cell phone and say, by the way, you're not gonna have children, it's part of my plan. Did he? Do you think he, no, I don't think he did. So Hannah is going through, God, why, why? In, in her time, the highest honor of a woman was to have a son for their husband. Why? So the name, see, you, you wanted a son to carry on your family name. And so a man picked a wife he thought would give, her, give him the best son to carry on the family name because your, your land, and also the son took care of the parents till they died. So I mean, it was really important to have this son. And so here we have these two wives, Hannah and the other one, and their rivals, and the adversaries having all the, the children. I mean, this is really bad. So difficult home situation. Number two, uh, I already said it, she had the pain of being childless. It's almost like, it almost meant that she had no use. I mean, what's a wife if she can't have children in this time? That's how they thought. Now, she also, uh, just think about when she lived. 
This woman lived in a time where you did not go to the grocery store. You guys have grocery stores around here. I haven't seen them. I haven't been around enough, but I know you do, right? We went by one in the rain yesterday, I guess, uh, and, and saw a big grocery store. They did not have grocery stores. Did you know what women did back then? They would grind the, the wheat into flour. They made the bread with their own hands. They collected wood to start the fire, to build a fire in the, in the kiln to bake the bread. Then they went and would kill the animal and clean it and slaughter it and bring it home and cook it. Do you understand how hard it was to be a woman back then? They did not have time to paint their nails and do their hair. They were working. Every ounce of water in the house, the woman carried to the house. You understand that? We're, we're talking about Bible times here, where you got up in the morning as soon as it was lighter before, and you would walk to the well, you'd carry the water, you'd get the grain, you'd grind the grain, you'd start the bread, you'd start the fire, you'd go get more wood, you'd start cooking that, but you had to go start the killing the whatever you were going to eat, you know, the, or, or you know, share it with someone else, the, the lamb or the goat or whatever. It was nonstop work. So when did you have time to read the Bible? Did they have Bibles? So you had to go to the, the tabernacle where they had the Bible and listen really hard and memorize stuff so that you always had the Word of God with you. That's what I mean by limited resources. Did you know nobody in this room has limited resources compared to Hannah? Look at you guys. You're sitting here. You're not grinding flour. None of you are grinding flour. Did any of you walk to the well and bring the water to your room? No. You went somewhere and ate. Did, did you make the food? Most of you didn't. Maybe you're on the team that helps, but you know what I mean? You're sitting in here. We don't have to get firewood. Look, you have light coming down on you from these. We have no limited resources. You have a copy of the Bible. You probably have more than one Bible. This is your English Bible. You might have another copy you know, in, in maybe your heart language. Do you understand what I mean? None of us have limited resources. Look at this. this we have these, we, you guys have phones? Do you know how much a phone is worth? Do you know how valuable that is? These people didn't have anything. I mean, their resources were food and a few things like a couple of garments that they had. I mean, they didn't even have, I mean, we change our clothes. I actually have three different shirts. You can tell which day it is by what color my shirt is. I have three shirts, and I go brown, green, and blue. And this is blue day, okay? And they weren't like that. And, and these are my jungle shirts. I have for cold weather shirts, and I have, you know what I mean? We're all like that. That's not what it was like back then. In the midst of all this hardship, Hannah had two habits, okay? And, and what those two habits are, are she prayed and meditated on the word of God. But let's, let's look at this. Um, now we're going to get to verse 13. So, wait a minute, who's my reader? Just Lee, you get to read 1 Samuel 1, 13 for us. Now, real quickly, where are we? We're on the annual trip that Hannah and her husband and family made to Shiloh. I'm going to show you a map of that in a minute. Hannah had a secret weapon. Hannah kept praying. Now, there are two things God says that are spiritual disciplines that we should practice. Jesus said, this kind cometh not but by fasting and prayer. Fasting is when I deny myself, my flesh. When I say no to the flesh. That's what fasting is. Uh, do you know what, at your age, one of the best things you could do for fasting would be? Say no. I'm not going to play games and listen to music and watch videos and, and brag on Facebook about my life and read about everybody else's life until I spent time with God. That's a kind of denying myself. Prayer is seeking God. 
So there's, there's two things, and we see them both in Hannah's life. She, you notice what it says, um, uh, she was in bitterness of soul. Look at verse eight, back up. Um, then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you, what's the next part of verse eight say? Not eat. Hannah was fasting. And in verse 13, what is she doing? Praying. She was denying herself and seeking God. That was her habit. And she brought, she didn't know what was going on. She didn't know why God wouldn't let her have children. And so instead of getting all just, you know, uh, totally distanced from the Lord, she sought the Lord with her problem. So that's why this begins the next section we're going to read here in our reading. Hannah was a woman of prayer. Look, look at verse 13. She's, she's speaking in her heart, but her voice was not heard. So what did, uh, did Eli think? She was what? Drunk. Drunk. What's she doing? She's like this. And he said, you're crazy. You're moving your mouth. You, what have you been drinking? Verse 14. So Eli says, put away your drink. And she says in verse 15, I'm a woman of sorrowfulness. I have neither drunk wine or intoxicating. I'm pouring out my soul before the Lord. Wow. What a, what a godly woman. Verse 18. And it, so she said, let your maidservant find favor. So the woman went her way, ate, and her face was no longer sad. Here's the lesson. She's a woman of prayer. She took her burden to the Lord and left it there. Now look, you know what? Most people, here's my backpack. Let's say this is my burden. And I bring it to the Lord. So... I forgot your name, tell me. Rodelio. Rodelio is going to be like the Lord. And I say, Lord, here's my burden. But I don't leave it with him. I take it with me. That's how most people pray. They don't leave their burden with the Lord. They show it to the Lord and they keep wearing it. See, it says in the Bible, cast your burdens on the Lord. Roll your burden on the Lord. Hannah did that. She came poured out her heart to the Lord in prayer and got up and was different. That's what a woman of prayer. How did she find comfort? Now this is, now let's go to chapter two and my next reader is gonna be uh, Faith. Um, you are gonna get to read verse one, Faith, and then uh, Camille, right, Camille? You're two and uh, let me just get here, Viet. You're three. First, Samuel two, three. And Maylin, four. And um, David, five. And Erica, six. Arnell, seven. And we're gonna go back to Jeremy, eight. And then to Ike, my technical assistant. You get nine. And uh, Ronell, 10. Okay, let's read all those in order, starting with uh, faith, verse 1. Now pause, don't read the next verse. My heart rejoices in who? The Lord. Not in, I had a child. Not in, my husband thinks I'm the best wife. Not in, that I have a comfortable life. See, there's sometimes the only thing we can rejoice in is the Lord. Nothing else changes. She still had to grind flour. She still didn't have any children. She still had a hard life. She still had everything against her. This adversary didn't change. She was still childless. She still had a rival. But what changed? She took her burden and left it. You see? Do you guys ever do that? Do you really do that? We all have problems. Do you ever, do you ever encourage and rejoice in the Lord even when nothing changes? See, that's what faith is. We trust God even though we can't see it. Okay, verse two. Verse two. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none 
anyone besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Wonderful reading. But did Hannah think all that up herself? Did she all of a sudden think, I'm going to call the Lord a rock. I'm going to say there's no one like the Lord. Where did she hear all that? She was listening when the Bible was read. What I'm going to show you in just a minute is, I'm going to show you where she found all this. And it's amazing. Okay, verse 3. And verse 4. Verse 4, the doors of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumble are greatly destroyed. And verse 5. Those who were pulled uh, higher than seven down for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has born seven children, but she who has had many sons. Wow, verse 6. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. Verse 8. I mean, verse 7, sorry. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. And now, verse 8. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap. He set them among princes and made them inherit the throne of glory. And verse and verse 9. And he has sent the world of anger and she will burn the pit of the saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for rest and no much of the day. And verse 10. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered, who will thunder against death and heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and solve the heart of his anointed. Now, what you just read, look at this. Hannah meditated on God in prayer and quoted seven Old Testament passages in one prayer. Do you remember when I came up and I said, you know, if, if one of you prayed, uh, Joseph prayed, would you notice if he quoted verses? Well, look at the verses she quotes. I, I put them out for you. No one is holy like the Lord. She's quoting from Exodus 15, 11. Uh, there, there is, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Uh, that you might know the Lord himself in Deuteronomy 4. He is God. Uh, there is no rock, verse 32, I mean, chapter 32, verse 4. He is the rock. Look at those three passages. All, she doesn't quote the whole verse. Meditation is you have studied something so much, you can pull truth out of it in appropriate context because you understand what you're reading. So in one verse, 1 Samuel 2, 2, she quotes three different passages. Now look at the next verse. In verse 6, he kills and makes alive. He brings down the grave and brings up. That's Deuteronomy 32, 39. She quotes and meditates. Verse 7, he makes poor and rich, brings low and lifts up. That's Deuteronomy 8, 17. Uh, that, that it's the Lord's hand that raises me up and not myself. And then in verse 8, he raises the poor from the dust. And she's quoting there from Deuteronomy, I mean from Job 36, 7. And again, from Job 38, 4 to 6. This is phenomenal that this woman who's grinding grain, making bread, building fires, you know, carrying water and living with a rival who is against her and childless took the time to know the word of God when she had no copy of the Bible. Do you understand how focused she was on the Lord. Do you understand how hard it was to get to the Bible? This is a map. See, this is the five miles, 10 miles. Um, that's where Shiloh was. Do you see where it is from Jerusalem? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Wow, did you know that, that Hannah could only get up there once a year and went up there once a year and when she went to Shiloh, it says that in chapter 1, she went yearly. She was like this. Whenever the Bible was being read, she says, could you read a little louder? I don't want to miss any of this. 
And she, she probably wrote it down. She copied what she heard. She kept it. She treasured it. But she didn't just put it in her drawer at home. She meditated on it. Now, you guys have to memorize verses, right? As part of Word of Life. There's two ways you can learn a verse. You learn it real quick to pass the quiz, and you forget it. That's what most people do, honestly. Do you know what the other thing you can do is? Treasure it. Is, is there like a 100,000 peso note? Or, or What's the money here called? Is it pesos? Pesos. Yeah. Is, how big is the biggest money in Philippines? 100,000? Isn't there a bigger one than that? Anybody know? A thousand is the biggest, okay? If I had a handful of thousands and I said, who wants one? Would you keep track of where it was? You wouldn't just set it down and say, I'll just put it right there. You'd put it somewhere special. You'd, put, you'd zip it in your bag. You'd put it in your wallet. Why? Because you know the value of money. Do you know the value of the word of God? Money is only temporary. The word of God lives and abides forever. And it's the only thing that can change us on the inside. So she really worked at it. Okay, her son was Samuel. Samuel was only equaled by Moses as far as the magnitude of his life. He ends, he's the last judge. He heads the order of prophets, founded the school for the prophets, he places Israel's first king on the throne and later anoints David. Wow. Why is that important? Because there's a, what time is this class over, by the way? What time? 20, okay. So I have lots of time. I, I should be able to get through this. Um, the, the Philistines were the people of the day. Now, in your Bibles, keep going to chapter 4. And where did I leave off reading? Okay. Um, Patricia. Patricia, could you read verse 1 of chapter 4? Oh. Who are the Philistines? Do you all know the Philistines? Who are they? Does anybody know? I mean, who do you think they were? They're the enemy of Israel, but where did they come from? Did you know on the map here, I can show you where they came from. I'm so glad they have this map here. Here's Israel, right here. The Philistines came from Greece, right here. Did you know that? They came actually from right here, the, the Cycladic Islands, uh, Crete, in this area right here. So see this big island in the middle of the Mediterranean? You know, you guys are way over in another wadi, body of water, but they're in the Mediterranean. They're on this island, and they come sailing their boats here. They were driven out of Egypt, and so they settled on the shore of what we would call Israel. Now, why does that matter? Because the Philistines were what we would call advanced um, technology. Uh, in our world today, most people know that, you know, like the Japanese are really good with uh, electronics, you know, and the Koreans, they're really good. And the Russians are really good with making armaments, you know, like missiles and bombs and stuff. And the Americans are really good at making stuff you really don't need, like movies and music and iPhones and iPads. I, there's a lot of I in there, you know. You know I, isn't it interesting? I, uh, like me, you know. But we recognize that. We recognize that the Chinese are really good at certain things and the Filipinos are really good at, at you know, uh, in fact, one of the things in the world that they talk about is that there are more Filipinos in hospitality. They're some of the warmest. It's like they smile all the time. You guys, everyone smile. 
You know what I mean? Uh, the Americans, it's like they're really good at, at what, I don't know what they're good at, but you know what I mean. But in the ancient world, the Philistines were advanced in technology. When you read the Bible, when the children of Israel fought the Philistines, the children of Israel came up carrying pitchforks. Do you know what that is? That's a wooden stick with a little piece of metal maybe not even metal, just maybe wooden pitchforks, you know, to pick up hay. And, and it says that they came with sticks. And what did the Philistines have? Metal shields. What did Israel not have? No metal shields. The Philistines had iron swords, iron. If I have an iron sword and you have a stick and I go like this, which one breaks? your stick. You lost, I won, I'm advanced. That's who the Philistines were. They were advanced because they came from Europe. They came from Greece. They came from the advanced civilization to the farming people. The people of Israel were farmers. They, they, they grew crops, they didn't build metal stuff. They were poor and the Philistines were rich they had boats. They were shipping stuff back and forth to Greece. They had metal works. They were very advanced. So the Philistines were, were very, very powerful. By the way, this is a Philistine burial uh, mask that you see right here. They, this is how they buried their people. They basically, um, they, would, they had these boxes that, that looked like, um, almost like, a, you know, a torpedo or a bullet, and they would have a, a hole right there, and they'd put the, the body, slip it through the hole, and then they would put that face mask thing over the hole, and that's how they buried their people. And they're finding these all over uh, the Philistine territory now that they're digging down. And this one is uh, from the Israel Museum. And when you walk in Israel, in Jerusalem today, when you walk into their museum, the first display there is all the Philistine stuff. And so they basically had advanced technology. And they, they had learned uh, in around 1400 BC, the big thing was bronze. And then about mm, 300 years later, the big thing was iron. And iron could break bronze. Bronze is tin and copper, and it's brittle, but it's stronger than wood. So you would fight with your bronze until someone came along with iron, and they won, they beat you. That's why they, in archeology, span they call it the Bronze Age, and then they call it the Iron Age. And guess who is the only one in the whole Middle East that had iron? The Philistines. And so they were dominant. By the way, this is, uh, the archeologists have found, this is a uh, Philistine um, vessel. These are all amphoras and bowls and everything. All of this stuff is from the Philistines and they were dominant. They oppressed Israel for 40 years. The only person that really had successes before Saul was Samuel, or I mean Samson. In chapter four where we're reading, look, look what they do. Um, verse two, let's see, my next reader. Who's my next reader? Uh, I forgot your name. Uh, um, is it Richard? Okay, can you read verse two? They went into 4,000 farmers, went in with their, their sticks, and they face the people with iron, and they get slaughtered. And they run away, and basically the ark, the ark gets captured by the Philistines. You all know this story. I mean, they took it out of the tent, they shouldn't, and all this happened. So the Philistines, uh, were the, the big problem of the day. Okay, 
Now let's look at where all this happened. In your Bibles, remember, uh, it's so important to, to know the context of, of where things happen. Here is Aphek. That's where this battle is. And so from Shiloh, where Samuel was and where Eli was and where the ark was, they take the ark to the battlefront at Ebenezer. All the Philistines come up. They, the Philistines lived here on the coast by the water. The Israelites lived in the mountains in the center of Israel. And they brought the ark and the Philistines captured the ark. That's what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Okay, then um, the, the Philistines take the ark to their cities, Ashdod, Gath, Ashkelon, Ekron, and, and they, they keep moving the ark around. Do you remember what happens? What happens? Uh, they put the ark in front of the god, their god Dagon, and what happens? He tips over, and doesn't just tip over, what does it do? Cuts. God cuts off the hands of this stone idol. And he falls down in front of the ark. And boy, that kind of bothered him. Their God was laying on his face in front of the Jewish people's ark. And so they start moving it around, and the Lord starts striking all the people. In fact, let's, let's read this. Uh, let's see. Verse, chapter 5 now, and we're on, what's your name? Hugh. Hugh. I have, to, I have to look at this sheet to memorize it. H-I-E-U. Hugh is going to read chapter 5, and you get to read 2 and 3. You're our special students, so you get two verses. Mm -hmm. Chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. When the Philippines uh, took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of uh, Daniel, and set it by Daniel. And when the people of Huh. And that wasn't very good. Now look at verse 9. And, uh, uh oh, you're not on my chart. Oh, well, can you read for us verse 9? Wow, outbreak of tumors. That's like cancer. Do you understand what happens? God not only tips over what we just read, the idol, he starts smiting the people with diseases. There are all kinds of uh, different terms of what some say that they were internal diseases, like uh, their, their intestines started falling out. What a gross thing. Others say it was huge. We're not sure of the Hebrew word. It could be big sores growing like a tumor. Have you ever seen someone with a tumor, you know, this big thing growing and oozing and bleeding? It doesn't matter which it was, whether it was your intestines falling out or big tumors growing on you. God smites Ashkelon, Gath, Ashdod, Ekron, and, and he, is, he is basically killing the Philistines because they stole the Ark of the Covenant. So basically uh, what happens is they decide they want to get rid of it. So let's go to chapter 6. Jerome, you're the next. And uh, it says, um, verse 6 of chapter 6. We'll get to the ending. So 1 Samuel 6.6, 6, Jerome. Why didn't you do hard in your hearts as the 
Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts. When he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go that they might fight? Whoa! Who's talking there? The Philistines are talking. Did you know the Philistines knew that God delivered the Jews from Egypt, that God sent the plagues, that God destroyed the Egyptian army, that God dried up the water and they came in the promised land? The Philistines had heard about all this. Do you understand, even though they were pagans, they did know that the God of Israel was great. So this is, this is what's going on in chapter six and seven. Uh, by the way, um, the, this again shows uh, another, uh, m you know, kind of map showing you. If you ever go to Israel, you land right here in Lod. That's where the airport is. They call it uh, the the Ben Gurion Airport in Lod. Joppa is where Jonah and the whale. That's where Peter was. All these places are in the Bible, and they're still geographic locations. Um, Mizpah is where we'll find the Saul. Bethel is the uh, uh, where Jacob, you know, slept on the rock and had the vision. Uh, Shiloh is where Samuel was and Eli. And Aphek is where this big battle took place. So basically the Philistine territory, the Israel territory. And, uh, and what we see, though, in all these biographies is that God wants us to see his perspective on what's going on with the person who's the right example and the person who's the wrong example. Now, I am supposed to pause and answer questions and explain things. And so, what time is it 9.20 or 9.30? 9.20. So we have uh, six minutes or so for me to answer questions. And uh, if you have none, then I will more expand into the Philistines and the biographies. Did, have I said anything so fast, or only said it briefly, that you have questions about? Anybody here? Anybody here? I mean, I can, I can talk forever, but I'm supposed to pause and answer questions. How about, about your uh, projects? Do you all understand the project? Do you know what will be probably a quiz question tomorrow? Have you started on your project, yes or no? So don't wait, you should start on them right away. You should start reading 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel because I always on the quizzes say, have you started reading 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel? Have you started your project? So how many hours does it take to read the whole Bible through? Okay, have you started reading First and Second Samuel, yes or no? Yes. How many of you have? How many of you are going to? Let's try that again. Before the quiz tomorrow, how many of you are going to start trying to work on your project? Raise your hand, everybody. Come on, Viet, raise your hand. You're gonna start working on your project. You know what that means? You're going to start as you read. Do you understand? Do it at the same time. As you're reading 1 Samuel, find a good chapter and do the, the title of the chapter. You can do that as you read. And start looking for the lessons. I actually write in my Bible when I find one. Look at this. Every time I read. I'm finding and, and underlining and circling and, and putting notes in. Just as you're reading your Bible, you can start marking the things that jump out at you and then you can uh, start typing them and thinking about the prayer that you're gonna do. So, in advance for tomorrow, when we meet, I'm gonna say, take out a little piece of paper. Now all of you will need, you know, to borrow a little piece of paper or find a little piece of paper and you're going to put your name on it and you're going to number one to five and the first question I'm going to ask you is, how long does it take to read the Bible? Then I'm going to say, have you started reading first and second Samuel? Have you started working on your title, 
summary of lessons, doctrines, truths that, that you see in the passage, and then applying them. Do you know a lot of people want to apply the verse? They say, now that's a verse Adrian should. Are you Adrian? Yeah. When you read the Bible, you say, Adrian needs that verse. I should tell him about that. That's something he really needs to hear. That's how we think of the Bible. We always think, no, Joseph, that's a verse for Joseph. He needs that verse. Do you know what we're supposed to do? That's a verse for who? That's what I want you to do. But don't just think that's a verse for me. Ask God. Say, Lord, I want to be like Hannah. I want to memorize verses that when I pray, I can ask you to do what you promised to do. I want to be like Hannah. That when I'm oppressed by my adversary, that I turn my, my trials over to you. So I'm going to say, have you started working on your project? What's the right answer? Yes. Let's try that again. Tomorrow, when I say, have you started working on your project? What's the right answer? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, do you know what the next question I'm going to ask is? I don't either. Honey, you're so much fun. Bonnie is the grade recorder and quiz doer and everything. She's my partner in all this. By the way, I would like to say this. I married Bonnie 35 years ago because she's the one person in the whole world I would like to spend all my time with. I would rather spend time with her than you guys. I have to be honest. I would rather sit and talk to her than do anything else, but I can't. I still have to work and do what I'm called to do. That's who she is. She's also the most genuine, godly person I've ever met in my whole life, ever. She is totally different than me. I grew up in a Christian home. I never, there, they used to take me to church before I was born, inside my mother. I was in church three times a week from birth on. I mean, I was always in church. I never remember a time I wasn't in church. Bonnie, she didn't come to know the Lord till she was 19 years old. And she was far from God, just like I was. Only she was in the world. And when she got saved, she completely changed. Uh, I meet a lot of people, I wonder if they really got saved because they haven't changed. They're still as mean as they used to be. And, you know, selfish and everything. She completely changed. Did you know at night, when I'm sleeping, I did it last night. I was sleeping and I went. And I looked over at Bonnie to see if her wings come out at night. No, I think she's an angel. I don't think she's really human because she's so sweet that I think she's an angel. But girls, ladies, if you want to, if you're ever thinking of uh, being married and want to talk to the best wife I've ever seen in the whole world, she's a great one to talk to. If you're ever thinking about serving the Lord, Bonnie has been a missionary, a Christian school teacher. She was a pastor's wife for 35 years. She's always available, you know, like to talk to you, to meet with you and anything. For me, the whole reason we traveled, we've traveled 20,000 miles so far to get here, flown 20,000 miles, is to spend time with you and to challenge you to be in God's word and to obey and love him. Thanks for giving me an extra minute. Have a good break. I'll see you later.